Hello and welcome to The Essential Reads. My name is Isaac and my goal is to bring you a bunch of classic audiobooks in an easy and accessible way. This is a Friday, so of course I am bringing you a short story. We are continuing with The Island of Dr. Moreau by H.G. Wells, and if you like what I do here and you want to support me, you can go to the Patreon, where you'll have access to exclusive audiobooks for as little as $1 a month, and you'll also be shouted out here, like Johan Matthias. Thank you so much for being a Patreon. Your patronage means the absolute world to me. Without further ado, let's dive into the book. The Island of Dr. Moreau by H.G. Wells Chapter 10 The Crying of the Man As I drew near the house, I saw that the light shone from the open door of my room. And then I heard, coming out of the darkness, at the side of that orange oblong of light, the voice of Montgomery, shouting, Prendick! I continued running. Presently, I heard him again. I replied by a feeble, Hello! And in another moment, had staggered up to him. Where have you been? said he, holding me at arm's length so that the light from the door fell upon my face. We've both been so busy that we forgot you until about half an hour ago. He led me into the room and sat me down in the deck chair. For a while, I was blindsided by the light. We did not think that you would start to explore this mm. island of Arth without telling us, he said. Mm. And then, but I was afraid. But what? <sighs> Hello? My last remaining strength slipped from me, and my head fell forward on my chest. I think he found a certain satisfaction in giving me brandy. For God's sake, said I, fasten that door. You've been meeting some of our curiosities, eh? said he. He locked the door and turned to me again. He asked me no questions, but gave me some more brandy and water and pressed me to eat. I was in a state of collapse. He said something vague about his forgetting to warn me, and asked me briefly when I left the house and what I had seen. I answered him as briefly, in fragmented sentences. Tell me what it all means, said I, in a state bordering on hysterics. It's nothing so very dreadful, said he, but I think you've had about enough for one day. <laughs> the puma suddenly gave a sharp yell of pain. At that, he swore under his breath. I'm damned, said he, if this place is not as bad as Gower Street with its cat. Montgomery, said I, what was that thing that came after me? Was it beast or was it man? If you don't sleep tonight, he said, you'll be off your head tomorrow. What was that thing that came after me? I asked. He looked me squarely in the eyes and twisted his mouth askew. His eyes, which had seemed animated a minute before, went dull. From your account, said he, I'm thinking it with a boggle. I felt a gust of intense irritation, which passed as quickly as it came. I flung myself into the chair again and pressed my hands on my forehead. The puma began once more. Montgomery came round behind me and put his hand on my shoulder. Look here, Prendick, he said. I had no business to let you drift out into the silly island of Arth. But it's not so bad as you feel, man. Your nerves are worked to rags. Let me give you something that will make you sleep. That will keep you on for hours, yet. You must simply get to sleep, or I won't answer for it. I did not reply. I bowed forward and covered my face with my hands. Presently, he returned with a small measure containing a dark liquid. This he gave me. I took it unresistingly, and he helped me into the hammock. When I awoke, it was broad day. For a little while, I lay flat, staring at the roof above me. The rafters, I observed, were made out of the timbers of a ship. Then I turned my head and saw a meal prepared for me on the table. I perceived that I was hungry, 
and prepared to clamber out of the hammock, which, very politely anticipating my intention, twisted round and deposited me on all fours on the floor. I got up and sat down before the food. I had a heavy feeling in my head, and only the vaguest memory at first of the things that had happened overnight. The morning breeze blew very pleasantly through the unglazed window, and that, and the food, contributed to the sense of animal comfort which I experienced. Presently, the door behind me, the door inward towards the yard of the enclosure, opened. I turned and saw Montgomery's face. All right, said he. I'm frightfully busy. And he shut the door. Afterwards, I discovered he had forgot to relock it. Then I recalled the expression of his face the previous night. And with that, the memory of all I had experienced reconstructed itself before me. Even as that fear came back to me, there came a cry from within. But this time, it was not the cry of a puma. I sat down the mouthful that hesitated upon my lips, and listened. Silence, save for the whisper of the morning breeze. I began to think my ears had deceived me. After a long pause, I resumed my meal, but with my ears still vigilant. Presently, I heard something else, very faint and low. I sat frozen in my attitude. Though it was faint and low, it moved me more profoundly than all that I had hitherto heard of the abominations behind the wall. There was no mistake this time in the quality of the dim, broken sounds. No doubt at all of their source for it was groaning, broken by sobs and gasps of anguish. It was no brute this time. It was a human being in torment. As I realised this, I rose, and in three steps had crossed the room, seized the handle of the door into the yard, and flung it open before me. Prendick! Man! Stop! cried Montgomery, intervening. A startled deerhound yelped and snarled. There was blood, I saw, in the sink, brown and some scarlet, and I smelt the peculiar smell of carbolic acid. Then, through an open doorway beyond, in the dim light of shadow, I saw something bound painfully upon the framework, scarred, red and bandaged, and then, blotting this out, appeared the face of old Moreau, white and terrible. In a moment, he had gripped me by the shoulder with a hand that was smeared red and twisted me off my feet and flung me headlong back into the room. He lifted me as though I was a little child. I fell at full length upon the floor. The door slammed and shut out of the passionate intensity of his face. Then I heard the key turn in the lock and Montgomery's voice in expostulation. Ruin the work of a lifetime, I heard Moreau say. He does not understand, said Montgomery, with other things that were inaudible. I can't spare the time yet, said Moreau. The rest I did not hear. I picked myself up and stood, trembling, my mind a chaos of the most horrible misgivings. Could it be possible, I thought, that such a thing as the vivisection of men was carried on here? The question shot like lightning across the tumultuous sky. And suddenly, the clouded horror of my mind condensed into a vivid realisation of my own danger. Thank you so very much for listening. If you enjoyed, please like, comment, share, all that jazz. And if you really enjoyed, do subscribe because there is more to come. And if you're listening on podcast, leave a review. It really helps get this in front of as many people as possible and reading them really makes my day. And if you want to support me in a more concrete way, you can either leave me a super thanks here on YouTube, you can leave me a tip on Ko-Fi, or you can go to Patreon, where you have access to exclusive audiobooks, as well as all of these ones, for as little as $1 a month. Once again, thank you for listening, and until next time, bye-bye.